Good morning. How y'all doing? Uh, some of you great. Others not so much. I get it. It's fine. Sunday morning. It's kind of early. Uh, if you didn't know, like she said, my name is Josh Trujillo. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in this church uh, back in 1978. That makes me 40. Now, I have fond memories of this church. Um, when I was younger, when this church was being built, I actually remember that. I remember uh, my parents were looking, at, looking for me. How many of you have ever lost your kids? Okay, that's fair. You know what? My parents lost me, and I turned out all right. Um, <laughs> twice, once in a mall in Dallas. That was fun for them. Uh, I, I didn't care. I was in KB stores looking at Legos. That's all I cared about. Uh, the other time, uh, they were looking around the building, and, you know, Orchard Avenue was right there, and they they're, got really freaked out because they're looking, at, looking for me for like 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and they found me in a five-gallon bucket in the fellowship hall. I'm a little guy. I don't know if you see my son. He's very tiny. I'm still not tall, uh, even though I'm 40 years old. Uh, um, uh, but I fell asleep, maybe even passed out from lack of oxygen, now that I think about it. That might have been what happened. Because uh, I was in a bucket just, and they found me crashed out, and then they were freaking out because there's this, just a yellow bucket in the middle of the, <laughs> in the middle of the fellowship hall, just just chilling. Uh, and then that's when they found me, and I turned out okay, even though I was deprived of oxygen for about 20 minutes. You know, no big deal, no big deal. Uh, thank you for joining us here. Thank you for joining us online. Um, uh, next week, uh, Pastor Abel is going to be uh, finishing off Ephesians. Uh, we're continuing our study of Ephesians today. Um, I'm really excited about, man, it's just about everything. We have that family that got baptized, y'all that got baptized today. That is just awesome. Let's give God a hand for that. That's just... There's something powerful about publicly declaring something, right? It's better than declaring bankruptcy. How many can agree? No? Okay. Some? It's okay. I'm, I joke a lot. If you don't laugh, that's fine, uh, but it will hurt my feelings, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll point it out, and then I'll cry at home, but you don't have to witness that, so it's okay. But last time we discussed this, Pastor Paul uh, had mentioned uh, his last point, which was uh, that we are children of light, and we shine in dark places so that others may know Christ. That's an awesome statement. We are children of light and we shine in dark places so that others may know Christ. Today we're going to be discussing or talking, walking through Ephesians 5, 22, 6 through 9. And we're going to look at how God's love should affect our relationships. Now, if you're alive, if you're existing, if you're on this planet, you have some form of relationship with people in whatever capacity that may be. It might be a husband and wife. You might be dating, right? You might be just talking. You might be just on Tinder. I'm not judging, okay? I don't know how you met, and that's fine. People, you know, I can't even imagine. Uh, There's a rule in my home. I get to die first because I refuse to have to date again. I refuse. I'm scared. It's it's a weird landscape out there for, for relationships. And not just dating relationships. Like friendships. I can't tell you how many meetings I'm in where we sit down for the meeting, right? Everybody, you know, manager, everything. And usually because uh, my job is based technically out of California, it's a Skype meeting, right? So we got the TV on and we got the speakers on and we're sitting there and everybody's doing this. See how weird that is right now? Like imagine that, that that's really what's happening. It, it, I feel, okay, let me just do one side note. Because we have online church, both Facebook and and through the app. So let's let's have a blanket time here. I'm talking about balance. Not extremes, balance. And our life should be balanced, right? We shouldn't be so focused on one thing that to the detriment of everything else in our lives. Is that fair? That's fair. Like, we just get new vices now, right? It used to just be drugs and alcohol, and gambling. And now we got the internet, and now officially gaming, right? Like, oh my gosh, he was on his PS4 for hours. But he hit prestige on that weapon, so it's good. It's good. 
See, we got some gamers in here, and that's fine. No judgment. When two people come together, relationships are weird, regardless of the context of relationships, right? In, the, in, in a marriage, like, I know for a fact that my wife was weirded out when we first got married because I did not close any cupboard or close any drawer. And I have no other reason than to say that I was 22 and lazy. Why don't you shut the cabinet? I don't know. I have no answer. I used to do the universal sign for I, may, I might make another sandwich. Do you all know what that is? The universal sign for I might make another sandwich? It's when you have the knife, you have the knife just laying over the sink, right, so it doesn't get dirty where the mayonnaise was. So it's just like sitting, you know what I mean? Like, if this, if this is a knife, and then here's the sink, it's laying like that. So the, the hand part is what's touching the filthy countertop, but in air, as you can see. And where the mayonnaise and mustard touch is disease-free. That's the universal sign that you're going to make, you might make another sandwich. I used to make sandwich. I lo- okay, I'll just... I'm not going to lie to you. I love Jesus, but I like to eat sandwiches. <laughs> I really like sandwiches. I mean, I really do. I could eat sandwiches for the rest of my life, and I'd be okay. I, a sandwich every meal, I'm fine. I'm weird. It's okay. I see some of you looking at me like, that's gross. You don't have to eat it. I'm fine. But, <laughs> Where was he even going with that? Who knows? Let's move on. Uh, <laughs> relationships are weird. Relationships are weird. We come into contact with people and we, we develop friendships, right? And all of a sudden, you grew up in a certain manner, they grew up in a certain manner, and then they do something you're like, that's not how you're supposed to do it. That is not how you load the dishes, Fred. What are we, barbarians? you got to rinse them off before you put them in there. It's disgusting. And you got to do dry cleaning because you're on the plate going like this. That's true dry cleaning right there. We have different habits. We have different rituals with our lives. And we come in contact with other people that have different rituals. And like, that's not real. Nobody really does that in real life. Nobody eats a peanut butter and salami sandwich. Some people do. I'm not one of them. Relax. I know I like sandwiches. That is not one of them. But we are creatures of habit. And we get into ruts, particularly in our relationships. And there's times that we need a wake-up call. We need to uh, take a self-inventory about where we are, how we act, how we need to progress and become the best version of ourselves, the way God intended us to be. So we're going to have some ground rules, okay? First ground rule is whenever we go into uh, this, especially this particular passage of Scripture, because we're, again, talking about relationships, a lot of times we'll use this in a very constructive manner by pointing out how people aren't living the life correctly, and here it is. Brother, See how you're living, and it's wrong, because if you'll notice in this scripture, (laughs) you're welcome. First and foremost, scripture, God's word should be used to affect us first. That's why Jesus even says it uh, later on, right? Why are you trying to get the, the speck out of their eye when you have a plank in your own, right? When you have a board sticking out of your eye. Deal with yourself first, then help them. It's supposed to be introspective first. How am I living? What am I doing? How is God wanting me to live? And then how do I apply that first to me? And then to other people I'm connected with. But first to me. Because I'll be honest. Uh... When I sometimes I'm reading scripture and I'll be like, Yeah, they need to hear this. This will change their life. I'm awesome, but you know, they could use the work. 
this passage that we're going to be reading, and that's Ephesians 5, 22 through 6, 9. Ephesians 5, 2, 22 through 6, 9 has this idea to allow God's love and wisdom to enhance our relationships. To enhance our relationships. Up until this point, if you didn't know, the entire book of Ephesians, before this, Paul had spent three years hanging out with the people in Ephesus. Three years. He knew them. He understand them. He knew Cheryl and Brian had a, had a dog named Todd. And it's really weird. That's in the Bible. I'm just kidding. It's not. It's in the book of Ualiah. Get it? You're a liar. Huh? See what I did there? That's a dad joke. You're welcome. But he had, he had an intimate knowledge of, of this church, of all the people living there. And so when he's giving these admonishments, when he's talking about in the earlier chapters of Ephesians about God's love, about God's grace, about his power living and, and breathing inside of us, about turning away from darkness, all these things, it's people he knows, he loves, he's cared for, he's ministered to, he's talked with, he's shared meals with, people he's deeply connected to, people he's has a relationship with. There's the ground rules, right? So then we read the first scripture, 5. 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's awesome. Then we get down into the nitty gritty. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Man, you hear that one, and sometimes when I've said this out loud, I've seen, I, I'll, you'll see this. And just looking at a crowd like this, you'll see this. funny. It's funny how we do that. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And again, we have that moment to go. Husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. We are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Verse 33. However, each of you, one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. That's loaded. That's loaded. Oh my gosh. Wives, submit to your husbands. Oh, sorry. Husbands, love your wives as Christ was the church and gave himself up for her. Oh, okay, bye. <laughs> They're loaded. So let's try to unpack it, okay? So if you didn't know, I want to tell you, and if you didn't know, I'm reminding you. This part of Scripture, the New Testament in particular, but this book was written in Greek. It's all Greek to me. Ha, <laughs> dad joke. You're welcome. <laughs> I know, that was dumb. And I, I'm okay with that. Um, it was written in Greek. So what does this word submit mean? Because language matters. Words matter. And we have to come to an agreement about what this idea means, Right? And when you have a translation from one language to another, things can get lost. A rolling stone gathers no moss. Now say that in Spanish. That idiom makes no sense. It makes no sense. So what does the original Greek tell us? What, what is Paul trying to say? Why, we hear, wives submit. The Greek and the phraseology right there of this statement is tricky. It means literally to get under, 
to lift up or to put into order. I'll be honest. I remember the first time I read this scripture, when I heard submit, I heard obey. And I wasn't even married at the time, so just put that out there. Liz, I love you. That's my wife. I hear submit, and then I automatically went to obey in my mind. And that's not the word they're using here. It's a completely different Greek word. I can't pronounce it, so I'm not going to try. But it's a different word. This word here means to get under, to lift up, or to put into order. And you hear those things. Get, lift up, put into order. That does not sound like something that's, okay, I'll do what you say. Right? Not putting yourself in subject to, but to lift up. To lift up, that's interesting. As a matter of fact, it's, a, it's closer to respect than it is to obey in our, in our modern language. That word submit. To respect rather than obey. And we see that later in the passage, right? At the very end. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Verse 33. However, you, however each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the second one, right there, and the wife must respect her husband. That's interesting. That's interesting. So what do we have next? And husbands love. Husbands love. So let me ask you this. Let's think about this for a second. We have wives respect. Okay, we've covered that. Now we have husbands love. Does that mean the husband doesn't have to respect? And does that mean the wife no longer has an obligation to love? But it's interesting the way it's separated, right? Because at the very, very beginning of this, in verse 21, what does it say? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Interesting. We've been talking about love this whole time, God's love, and then talking about love with each other. Now we're introducing this thing, submit, which we know now to be respect, but why does it separate it out? Men, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. And the only thing I could come to, only consensus I could see even with theologians, is that this, this, this separation here has more to do with what we need as human beings rather than what we should uh, be expected to do. What do I mean by that? Meaning that as a man, I have a deep emotional need to be respected. Regardless of if it's my wife or not. Right? Don't you disrespect me in my own house. You ever heard that? I said that to my kids. Are you going to disrespect me in front of my friends? In front of my friends? We have this deep, deep need. And I, uh, this, I'm not even going to put it on you, but on, in general, okay? Blank statement, in general, to have a need for respect as men. Could the, could the other part be also true, that, that women, wives, have a deep need to feel loved? You don't buy me flowers anymore. We never go out anymore. Do you love me? I joke about that, but... There's some truth there, right? There's some truth there. We wouldn't write songs about it if it wasn't a part of the human experience. We have these deep needs. And right here, Paul's addressing that. Look, wives, man, help a brother out. Respect your husband. Men, do not forget to love your wives as Christ loved the church. As Christ is the head of the body. It's always pointing back to Christ because in the end, it's about love and respect. Love and respect. All of Ephesians 1 through 5 is talking about love and now we're getting this, this added idea of respect. It's interesting. Now let's go on. Children, 
So if you are a human here, you either are or have been at one time a children. Unless you know something I don't. Like, because then you're, you're messing around with some weird science stuff and that's scary. Children, obey. There it is. There's the word. It literally means obey. There's no question about that. That's in the Greek. It means obey. You're welcome. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy a long life in the earth, because your parents will no longer have to murder you. Because you frustrated them so bad. I gotta tell you, I'm I'm an honorary individual. Uh, I am not a perfect human being, and I cannot tell you, my mom, she just sits over there. I can't tell you how many times I've made her cry in anger at me. And those of you who spend enough time around, I was like, I could see it. I could see it. One time uh, we went to Taco Bell, because that's what you do. And uh, I got a bean burrito because it's my favorite. And my brother, who's six years older, would go to uh, at the time he was in high school, so he'd go to school much earlier than I did. Um, and so then I woke up and I had a burrito from the night before, and I was excited <laughs> having that for breakfast. We're doing it. And it was not a breakfast burrito, mind you. It's just beans, sauce, cheese, sour cream, but not onions. Because I'm not a barbarian, okay? No lettuce, no nothing. Just a Taco Bell bean burrito. That's for real. And so, I'm all excited. I'm jazzed. I'm 10. I, this is my highlight of my life. Going to have the burrito in the morning. Go to the fridge. There is no said burrito. And I proceed to uh, what kids say today. Freak out on my mom because she let my troll of a brother <laughs> eat my burrito and I was crushed and I was crying and finally she had enough and she's like what do you want me to do you want me to have him puke it up so you can eat it it's gone okay it's gone he's at school you can't have it <laughs> and it was terrible it was terrible. Shar, if you're watching online, I'm sorry. I was not always a good kid. So the word obey, what does that actually mean? Again, language matters, ideas matter. The word obey here is not a blind, it's not a blind obedience. That's the interesting part too. It says obey in the Lord. So like if your parents ask you to like, I don't know, rob a bank, don't, okay? You can, you can say no. I don't have to obey you in this one. That's not in the Lord, Mom. It's not a blind obedience. It's also interesting that obey, this obey means to listen or to hearken to. That's a fun word we don't say anymore. Hark. Hark. To listen or to hearken to. What does that mean? It means to hear, to internalize, and then, for, and then to cause action. In the simplest of ways, clean your room. I heard it, thought about it, and then I did it. This is the establishment of understanding how our place is with authority. Because if you don't understand that, if you don't have obedience as a, as a child, hearing, internalizing, and action because of it, you will have a bad time as you get older. How many videos do we have of people trying to, uh, let's just be honest, disrespect policemen? Regardless of what the reason is. Let's, let's, how about this? That's a political, that's, that's a politically charged. How about when kids are in school? Could, could, we, could we not? How, oh, man. This is, okay, 
I'm going to get on soapbox right now. Okay, ready? Uh, I was, uh, so I was in college as an alderman. Uh, I was, uh, I graduated at 35, so I was a little bit older when I got my bachelor's. And um, I remember hearing one individual basically tell his professor, uh, yeah, I got a D on that test. What are we going to do about that? What do you mean, what are we going to do about that? Nothing. I mean, we're doing what we're supposed to do. I'm teaching, you're testing, and you got a bummer outcome. Sorry. But yeah, okay, I understand. What are we going to do with that? Okay, I know I missed the deadline. I know I missed the deadline for that homework, but how, how do we make this better? You don't. You missed the deadline, bro. If you don't have a healthy understanding of obedience, healthy, not blind obedience, with authority, you're going to have a bad time. We're going to have a bad time. That's why this is important. It will go well with you. You will have a long life. Again, because your parents will not have to murder you. Verse 4. Fathers, let's just add in their parents. Do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Do not exasperate your children. This does not mean do not upset them. Because if you tell them to do something, or you tell them they cannot do something, you will upset them. We okay? Don't do that. (laughs) You don't understand me. Sorry to camera guys and online everybody. <laughs> it's kind of weird for anybody that wasn't here. Uh, it does not mean to upset. That's not the word there. Exacerbate means to come down harshly in your correction. The extreme of that. You're not doing anything right. I ask you time and time again. I'm sick of it. You never do it right. What's wrong with you? That's rough. I know you're learning. <laughs> Let me just show you. Okay. I'm going to show you, then you're going to do it. That's better. You're getting better. There needs to be improvement, but you're doing better. Two completely different approaches. One is a destruction of, of not only will, but also of spirit. What's wrong with you? Why can't you do it right? Why can't you read my mind and do it the way that I thought you would? be fair. Let's be fair as parents. I've done this. Mostly out of fear for my life because my daughter's learning how to drive. (laughs) But I've done this. I wish I could say, like, you know what? I'm a great dad and I never exasperate my kids and I'm always uplifting and caring and loving. Hallelujah, bless the Lamb, brother. (laughs) Do not bring discouragement. Parents, your kids will not do it right every time. As a matter of fact, they might not do it right for a long time. Growing up takes time. Right? You're in training for 18 years. Think about that. We don't consider you you adult for 18 years. There's a reason for that, because it takes time to grow up. Do not bring discouragement. They're kids. They're going to do it wrong. And that's okay. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Let's try this again. Let me show you. It is our jobs as parents to remember that and give instruction, give training, give insight so that they, as our children, can grow into the best version of themselves. What is the best version of them? How can we help that along? And it's not the extreme, like, you can do anything. That's not true. Don't lie to kids. They can't. I'm never going to be in the NBA. I am 5'4". It is not going to happen, and I'm okay with that. I'll get buckets. No, I don't. 
I do not. Training, instruction, insight. Fathers do not, parents do not exasperate your children. All right. Fun stuff now, verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. This one's kind of hard to unpack. Like, what is the ancient wisdom here that we can apply today? Because there is still indentured servitude. We're still finding slavery in places, even in the United States, in really weird ways. But in reality, slavery has been abolished. So how could we connect with this here? Well, first century Judaism, right? First century Rome, about two-thirds of the people are slaves. Before that, even maybe like a hundred years, we're talking 90% of the Roman Empire were slaves. In the beginning, it was more, uh, it could be interpreted as a bond servant, right? Somebody who decided, I'm going to be a slave because of X, Y, Z reasons. As a matter of fact, slaves could uh, own property. They could make money. It was a different time. Not like the connotation that slavery has at the inception of our country, right? Where there were people who were taken in bondage and brought over in boats and, and taken in bondage uh, here, Native Americans. Not, not, I mean, it is slavery, but not in not that same context here. So let's flip it. Instead of seeing slaves... What if we could look at and say servants or even employees? It has, a different, it has a different feel to it when we look at it like that. Employees, obey your earthly bosses. It's interesting. Verse 5. Employees, obey your earthly bosses with respect and fear. And with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as employees of Christ, <laughs> doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether an employee or an entrepreneur. Whether you have a boss or you don't. You read it like that. And then you read verse 6. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, Man, when the boss is around, Terry is an awesome worker, but when he goes away, man, he don't do nothing. And I'm sick of picking up the slack. But here's the thing. This is supposed to be internalized. This is supposed to be how we view ourselves. First in husband and wife relationships. Next, father, or children to their parents. Parents to their children. And now, uh, somebody who's in servant servanthood to another. And again, what does this all come down to? Love and respect. I'm going to love and respect the position, maybe even not even the person, the position enough that I'm going to do my job when I'm supposed to and I'm not going to watch Netflix at work. <laughs> That's real now, man. <laughs> as, you, as, as you get older, right, as you exist, Things become weird, and it's a normal thing now for uh, employees to watch Netflix at work. That blows my mind. Especially when I'm playing the, my Nintendo Switch at work. I'm like, these kids. <laughs> Quick survey. Who thinks it's okay to watch Netflix at work? That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. I would check the policies and procedures so you do not get fired. Just saying. Obey not only to win their favor when their eyes on you, but as, as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly as if you're serving the Lord. Verse 9. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Wait. Even in the original context, that sounds weird. How are masters supposed to treat their slaves in the same way? Love and respect. 
love and respect. You have this principle of how to be a godly employee. They have this principle of how to be a godly boss, how to be a godly manager, how to have oversight. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he is both, who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there's no favoritism with him. There's no, you're not better. We're not better because we hold a position. We're not, we're not worse because we hold a position. We have love and respect for everybody. It's not telling somebody what to do and then not, you know, how about this? How many of you have had a boss? who would tell people what to do and then go into their office and not do anything. That can be frustrating. That can be frustrating. But here's the deal. Introspective first. How many of you as bosses would do the same thing? Hey, I've earned this. I was in in the weeds. I was in the trenches. And now I'm a manager and I get to do the same thing. It's introspection. It's supposed to be here first. To serve, to listen to, to do it for God. Not just when they see, but when they don't. Respecting everyone, loving everyone. God has a desire for us to give love and respect to those we are connected to. God has a desire and desires for us to give love and respect to those we are connected to. Love and respect. We can't avoid it. If we're going to be followers of Christ, if we want to follow with tenements, if we're going to try to be the best version of ourselves, when we live our lives, we have to live it with love and respect. Here's where it gets to be a bummer. In our society, how is it usually? I'll give you respect if you... you you got to respect me first, man. you got to earn it. And that makes total sense. I'll be honest. That feels right. Doesn't it? Like, why would, why would I respect this guy? He's a buffoon. And he shows me no respect. But we are not responsible but for anybody else's actions but our own. We're not responsible for anybody else but our own. Re- like, responses to any any outward stimuli. Our job is to love and respect regardless of how people treat us. That's hard. That is hard. So let's rewind that. Go back to the beginning. As husbands and wives, how am I supposed to love and respect my wife if she doesn't love and respect me? That's not your job. Your job is not to make somebody else love and respect you. This isn't the office. I want people to love or fear how much they love me. Love and respect is supposed to start with us first. Us first. So in a dating, in a marriage, in a friendship, those things have to come from us first. Love and respect. And if they don't love and respect us, doesn't matter. Oh my gosh, that's rough. It gets worse. Love and respect your parents. Parents, love and respect your children. Man, sometimes, you know, I love Lana, but I want to punch her in her face. No, I'm just kidding. Kidding. I'm not promoting abuse. Nobody say anything dumb. Pastor Josh does not beat his children. I will make fun of them, though. <laughs> love and respect. Employees, employers, oh my gosh, when you're getting a paycheck... And somebody lords it over you. It's like, well, you want to keep a job here. It's like, oh my gosh, I do want to keep my job here. Love and respect. You have employees that might not be acting the way they should, and might not be working the way they should. Love and respect. Everything you do has to be filled with that. And just think how different our world would be if everyone did that. Think about that. How different would our job site be if that was the tenement of, of wherever we worked, the bank, uh, the police department, uh, at a health care provider, at the hospital, at, at a school, if everyone loved 
and respected each other. How different would that be? It's not going to start unless it starts with us. It's not going to happen unless we choose to do it. Because again, we're only responsible for me and for all the me's represented in here. But we have obstacles. This takes time. You cannot microwave love and respect. It is a crock pot. It's low and slow. It's a barbecue. It takes time. And you know what? If you've just come to Christ as an older individual, or if you've experienced any life in general, if it's taken you 40 years to live a certain way, and you want to change that, it's going to take some time to unpack and be a different way. And that's okay. As long as you're progressing towards that, look, as long as you're moving like this, well, at least I'm not there. At least I'm not there. Man, I need to be there, but I'm getting better. I'm getting better. It takes time. There is no fast way to, to have love and respect in your life. It takes time because you're going to go through it, man. You're going to have that bad experience with the boss. You're going to have that bad experience with somebody in authority. You're going to have that bad experience with somebody in a relationship. You're going to have that bad experience, and you still have to choose in my heart of hearts, I am going to love and respect because that is what Christ did for me. So I choose. Like those of you who are baptized, I declare. I declare that I'm going to live love and respect in my life. Sure. So as we close, I want to put a question to you. Is there any area, and I'm going to say of our lives, because I am not excluded from this, where love and respect needs to be greater? You can make it broad in, re- in your friendships, in, in your marriage, in your dating relationship, in... in um, in, in, uh, with children, with cousins. Who cares? Just look at every relationship you have. Is there anything, any place, anywhere where I'm not living in love and respect? You can get more specific even. Say, you know what? Am I giving love and respect to this person, to that person? And is it regardless of how they're treating me? Oh, it's rough. But that's the question for us today. Because God desires for us have love and respect for those we are connected to. Let's bow our heads. I don't know where you are in your faith journey. If you're online, what you're going through, what you've experienced this year, this week even. But if you're like me, and I'm going to raise my hand, you can look up here, you cannot, but I'm raising my hand. I know there are areas of my life, there are people in my life where I'm not showing enough love and respect to. So if that's you and you're like me, it's like, you know what? I need to continue to improve. I'd say raise your hand and declare that today. I need help. I need help. God, help me. God, help me. Man, I have these tendencies. I have, the, I have these, these issues, this brokenness in my life. And I need help. And I say, go a step further. Is there somebody you know that God is bringing even to your heart, to your mind right now, whether online, on Facebook, or in this building, you know, I need to love and respect this person. And you have a name. God, help us. God, help us. God, help us. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, you saw those hands. Holy Spirit, you're in this place and you you know our hearts and I just ask that you would touch every single one of us, Lord God, as we declare to you that we need your help to have love and respect in our relationships. Lord God, how revolutionary would that be, Lord God, to see that in this congregation and as people see it, maybe even it growing and infecting other minds and ideas so that love and respect can be at the center of every place in this in this city or wherever anybody is online. 
Lord God, let it start with us. Let it start with me, God, to increase with love and respect of everyone. Father, I thank you for this. Lord, I pray that as we go, as we, as we have lunch and all this other stuff, God, that you would help us. God, help us. Have mercy on us sinners. To have love and respect where we should. We pray this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Everybody, let's give a hand clap for the Lord. That is, that is an awesome declaration.